Hello again. Well, I'd like to introduce our next session with Dr. Matthew Trinker, who is speaking about collection, culture and meaning. Dr. Matthew Trinker is the director of the National Museum of Australia, chair of ICOM Australia and co-chair of the Australia Singapore Arts Group. Under Dr. Trinker's leadership, the National Museum has developed strongly engaged national and international programs that focus on bringing alive the stories of Australia for audiences around the country and overseas. Please, as you think of them, submit your questions to Dr. Trinker using the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the page. Over to you. Thanks, Monica, for that uh, introduction and good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Can I begin, uh, as always, by acknowledging uh, that uh, the land that I'm uh, on this afternoon, where I'm lucky enough to work, is the land of the Nunawal, Ngunnawal, Ngambri peoples uh, of Canberra. And uh, I'd like to extend the respect I offer them and the thanks, quite frankly, uh, for the welcome that we, um, we've received here in this place. Uh, uh, long-standing welcome from the peoples of Canberra. Uh, I'd like to offer that uh, respect to all First Nations people joining us today. And in a sense, I'd like to begin by reflecting on the fact that we're at a point in this century when we are really revising and remaking the relationship between communities of origin uh, and our heritage collections, in particular, the artefactual collections that are held in museums and galleries and other like uh, institutions. And in Australia, as in Canada, USA, Britain, New Zealand, South Africa, and many other places, efforts are being made to restore connections of communities to collections of things that really vivify their lives and cultures. <clears throat> you can see there, side of the British Museum. There's no doubt that museums such as it is, and indeed all museums, when you think about uh, our histories uh, in the last two centuries, uh, there are attempts being made by museums really to deal with their colonial past. And the museum as an institution was really born in the age of empire and implicated in imperial trade and commerce. And hence, the phrase decolonising the museum has become a, a standard descriptor of myriad efforts uh, the museums around the world are making to transcend their colonial roots and establish new forms of relation between communities and collection. And these questions have an acute resonance in our country, which is dealing with its own colonial past and the impact of that history on present day relationships between First Peoples and all who have come after, and no one working in the nation's cultural organisations, whether it's museums, galleries, libraries, or archives, can or really should be ignorant of this. And in the way we work with the great heritage collections of nation, I think we've got a responsibility to support and influence the very necessary and ongoing public conversation about these matters. Um, I want to speak today a little about the past year at the National Museum as it dealt with a key moment in that ongoing conversation. That is the work related to the 250th anniversary of the voyage of Captain James Cook on the Endeavour. And then I want to turn to the broader implications of that work and suggest how we might rethink uh, our collections. And of course, I'll be speaking mostly uh, about what I know best about museums and galleries, but I hope it's got some real use for all of you in the wider glam sector. And I think that many of the questions we face in museums are indeed faced by all of us who work with the great collections of this country uh, right across the full spectrum of institutions uh, in, uh, in the glam world. And uh, it's really in that sense that I hope you'll be able to draw something from my study both of the past year, but also the implications of that for museum collections. Now, the risk of stating the obvious, 2020 was a year that challenged us all. It's um, fair to say that it took us all by surprise uh, and it continues to take us by surprise. It's a, a very dynamic condition that we find ourselves in after almost a year of dealing um, with the crisis. And Coming after that calamitous season of bushfires in 2019-20, over that summer, 
the pandemic seemed to take all our energy and thought. It seemed to be all consuming for a while there at least. And in many ways, it's still demanding a great deal of our attention. And one of the consequences of this was that other important compelling issues were seemingly pushed to the margins. And speaking personally, I was wholly prepared for 2020 to be really about how we as a nation would or could speak about this man, about Captain James Cook, particularly given the context of our ongoing national debate, seeking a more just and reconciled relationship between the first peoples of this land and all who've come after. And at the National Museum, we spent uh, really three years leading up to 2020 working on a major exhibition that was wholly focused on telling this story anew. And we were joined in this work by great partners uh, at the National Library of Australia and indeed the Australian National Maritime Museum. We wanted to think about how to set really the view from the shore, that is, of, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that were directly touched by the voyage, we wanted to set that view alongside that more established narrative of Cook and his expeditionary crew. And we wanted the stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities implicated in the voyage to be told in their own words. I break here just to apologise for what seems to be a, a timing issue on my screen, but you'll see that I'll cycle back uh, to images that suit more the point I am um, up to in this presentation. My apologies for uh, something that's obviously been introduced in the presentation. Now, we didn't understand, we did understand rather, we didn't underestimate the challenge of this. The challenge was of striking real and durable, honest, collaborative arrangements with 10 communities along the eastern seaboard so that they could tell the story of 1770 from their own perspective. And of course, the great challenge of joining those stories to a contemporary retelling of the view uh, from the ship. And this slide gives you a sense of the uh, extent of the communities that we were um, intent on working with, really striking partnerships with along the Eastern Seaboard. And the great question was how to hold those contrasting perspectives in our hands and allow the conflict to be present that's obvious uh, when we come to this subject without creating a work that was wholly seen in deficit and would provoke really without also helping to inform. And the intention there was to try and engender an honest, more just sense of ourselves and our responsibilities to the past that we have as a people, as a national community, not to simply harden perspectives uh, and emphasise opposition. The answer was really to develop this program of work with the 10 communities and to develop the, with them rather than for them, clearly. It was a big undertaking. You can see that it ranged up and down the Australian East Coast from Mundabubal, at, uh, otherwise known as Point Hicks, to Bednug at Possession Island over several years. And it wasn't in any ways a consultation, but really a co-work and a co-curation exercise with a dividend really for those communities in terms of job creation locally and skills training in cultural work. And uh, on top of that, we wanted to ensure that there were some funds to run events and to respond to the anniversary at a local level. Uh, additionally, the program incorporated funds uh, for uh, cultural worker jobs in communities, uh, jobs that were filled by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in those places, supported by us to develop local responses to the Cook anniversary and to provide content for the exhibition. And it also funded the second round of our Encounters uh, Cultural Worker Fellowships, which gave six uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from regional re remote communities a chance to work with us for three months and then to travel overseas to Britain to research First Peoples collections uh, there. And altogether, it was about uh, a project with costs between six and seven million dollars aimed at uh, really reconceiving how we might think about our history, in this case, this, uh, this story of the Cook Voyage. 
but in ways that address uh, what are clearly the long-standing injustices and inequities in the way we've imagined ourselves as a nation and offer people a more productive way through that process that helped to build what we hope will be a shared future that's just equitable and honest about what's gone before. Uh, it included collections coming from abroad and the obvious questions that those collections raised were germane to this work. Here you see a collection of spears made by uh, the community at La Perouse accompanying uh, spears that came from Cambridge Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology, spears that were collected at Camay by Cook in the conflict uh, that erupted on those shores uh, at his first landing in 1770. And in the wider context of the continuing campaign for constitutional recognition of First Peoples and indeed the Uluru Statement from the Heart, we understood that there were responsibilities that came with this work that really attended to broader national conversations that we were having. And we knew that in finding a way to think about Cook and the anniversary, we were also prompting or at least contributing to a wider national conversation on our history. One of the key proceeds of that work um, was the major exhibition, Endeavour Voyage, the untold stories of Cook and the first Australians, which, can, which you can see in Canberra now. But back in uh, March 2020, as the country really entered into lockdown, indeed, we closed our doors, we did wonder whether anyone would get the chance to see uh, this exhibition in the flesh. It was all but done when frustratingly uh, we were forced to lock down. And of course, we found that where there was to be uh, an audience uh, for this work in early April, uh, we had an exhibition uh, with the doors shut uh, and with people unable to really come in and start to engage uh, with the work. And I remember looking at a great colleague, uh, one of the uh, senior curators who worked on the project, a woman called Shona Coyne, a Noongar woman from Albany in Western Australia. And uh, seeing her obvious distress really, uh, as she realized that all that work with communities and the intention of communities uh, up and down uh, Australia's East Coast might never be quite realised in the way that had been a thought. And really there and then, before we'd even heard the words digital pivot, um, we decided that we had to focus all our attention on delivering the content and experiences of this work online. Now, I'm, I know that this audience is very practised at delivering services information online. I don't want to come across as some kind of digital ingenue. And we always had an eye to digital content that was going to support, support the program online, but more or less in a way that would be adjunctive in the common way that museums uh, have tended to work in that digital space alongside exhibitions adjunctive to the exhibition here in Canberra. But indeed, we found ourselves looking very differently at how we could take the fuller experience of the exhibition related program uh, to uh, people in their own homes. And fortunately, the show had a host of video and animated graphics that could be repurposed for digital delivery. And here you see a screenshot of the work that we started uh, to be able to do uh, online, which was really about bringing uh, the richness of this exhibition to uh, people in their own uh, living rooms. And we also had Fortunately, some great work that we commissioned, especially uh, for this exhibition. Uh, filmmaker, artist and designer, Alison Page uh, was working on a film, uh, The Message, which was installed at the heart of the, the physical exhibition, but of course became a great way of attracting audiences online with elements going out on social media, as well as available through the site we established for the exhibition online. And I'd encourage you to Google and take a look at the film, you can get it online, which I think gives a sense of the widened professional practice of museums today and of how we think actively beyond the traditional confines indeed of collection. And the message has been, you're seeing a, a shot of it there with an audience in the physical show, 
has been um, really lauded, not just for its aesthetics and its imagination, but also for the sense of voice or narrative power that it's enabled for the communities that were involved. And it's a credit to Alison, but also um, to all those people from the communities up and down the East Coast who actually uh, are featured in the film. So I think it focuses the mind to realise that those people in the film are descendants of those who would have witnessed or encountered uh, Cook's voyage. And the message was the first part of the, really the, the, the content was released online. And what we tried to do was release content uh, sequentially after that time, as we were touching dates that were um, drawn from the well-established narrative of Cook's charting of the coast. So you had releases of content over the three or four months as notionally the journey um, progressed. And of course, by June, we were able to open the museum uh, we have been able to give people a sense of the exhibition. Here you're seeing a shot of the entry piece, which is uh, an uh, imaginative um, form for the three water spouts that Cook records uh, early in uh, the narratives and which feature also in the accounts of uh, the Aboriginal people of Munda Bubal about uh, the sense of omen foreboding that came from seeing these phenomena at sea. Now, to date, more than 100,000 people have seen the exhibition, which is um, pretty good considering the COVID-inspired restrictions are in place to manage numbers in our gallery space. And of course, uh, many people have now had the opportunity to engage with this, this exhibition, the richness of the content online. Now, I've sketched this out because I wanted really to offer this as um, an emblem of some of the powerful forces at work in our national life, but also about what's been enabled, some of the thinking that's possible around collections and indeed the work we do with collections in this time of COVID and beyond. And I think it's true to say that COVID's made us rethink and refocus our attention in all we do. And I think that's true of our practice We've uh, compressed five or 10 years worth of digital technology adoption, if you like, really into a few months. And it's true to say that the way we work now is wholly different from uh, how it might have been even just uh, a year ago. But I think it's also true about the great heritage collections of nation and how we think about uh, their place in the nation, and we commit ourselves to new ways of working with uh, communities, certainly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but also other communities of origin for our collections to really help deal with ongoing questions about what our history is and what it means for us in the present and the future. And the work of the Museum on Endeavour Voyage and other uh, related training and skills development programs has really shown me that it's uh, when we are working in real collaborations and partnerships with communities that the great strength of the heritage collections of nations can be um, brought to bear on our convulsing and compelling uh, national questions. And I think when in reflecting back on work, say with this project you're seeing on screen now, the Canning Stock Route project uh, from 2011, when I think of the work with the British Museum, but also with 30 communities across the country for the Encounters project in 2015, and indeed for the Songlines project uh, in 2017-18, the strength of all those projects was only enabled by the quality of partnership and collaboration, and in fact, the generosity of the communities that were prepared to work uh, with our staff uh, here uh, at the National Museum, and indeed with the staff of other museums, both here and abroad. And if there's a deep truth in that, it is that it's the relation between peoples that is the great strength of these collections and their interpretive power, and indeed, it's the strength and attachment of source communities to these things, their things that are held in trust that um, give them meaning uh, and uh, power and uh, uh, community strength. 
just want to finish with um, some words about what I think this means for museums, galleries, and indeed some of our practice in libraries too. So I think it's clear that where uh, it's impossible to think of these collections, the collections of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in, uh, in our museums without thinking about uh, the engagement, the responsibilities we have to communities of origin in all, uh, our, um, all our responsibilities being discharged for these things. And clearly the growing calls for the permanent return of cultural property like the Gweagle Shield that you see here famously in the collection of the British Museum and now the source of continuing um, uh, advocacy to see its return permanently to this country. There are no there's no doubt that these will continue to be um, important, they'll be made strongly as they should be, and that these crucial questions about the return of collections to First Peoples will remain an important way for museums to both look to their past, to redress the injustices of the past, but also to, to strike um, honest and more um, open relationships than they might have had with communities uh, for the future. It's true also of the Camay Spears that feature in the exhibition and which have come back really after close work with the La Perouse community at Camay, uh, a community which is intently focused on the importance of these spears in terms of their life. But I think that if we are truly to re-engineer the way the contemporary museum uh, works to transcend its colonial past, it's going to be necessary for us to fundamentally change the way we understand the terms by which we hold these collections. We often use the term custodial to describe museums' responsibilities, but in truth, institutions right across this country still rely on narrowly conceived uh, conceptions of property rights to give them legal certainty in their ownership of collections in their care. And this institutional insistence on ownership is itself a consequence of museums colonial past and an enlightenment fascination with the idea of freehold but the Marbo and Wick judgments on native title have shown us that those assumptions about title and property rights in Australia were founded on legal misconceptions and that both judgments in a sense have opened up the possibility not just for understanding that rights in land can coexist and persist along rights other rights and associations but indeed that opportunity for rethinking about what property ownership more generally means is now before us when we start to think about collections. Why, for instance, is it the case that community interests and native title rights can coexist in land, but is not possible for us to reconceive in a similar fashion about how we understand the title of things in museums and other institutions? And I think there's a guide here for those of us looking for a sustainable answer to the question of how we might properly and fairly acknowledge and enable the rights of communities uh, to, to their things that are held in trust. And through the refinement of the terms and circumstances by which these collections exist in the public realm. And if we were to establish a new set of legal principles, perhaps, to govern the management of material culture collections more broadly, one that represented the shared material interest in those collections rather than accenting individual organisational property rights, then perhaps in institutions might be able to better found that sense of collaborative, open and engaged uh, partnership with uh, communities around the country. And it, I accept that this calls for a radical recasting of the terms by which we hold research, interpret, exhibit collections, but it does so in a way that would allow us to express acknowledge that they are only held because of the continued agreement and acknowledged interests of communities of origin being properly honoured and not as a result of legal title that's been held to have been secured at the time of acquisition. Now, this is work I think that is ahead for us all in this century, the work of rethinking and uh, recalibrating the way that we understand collections and not just the collections of First Nations in our museums, perhaps indeed collections uh, that have come from 
a range of communities that are now held in trust uh, for the nation. And the decisions that we make in respect to the way we think about collections and our preparedness to think about what it means to renegotiate the terms of property rights really helps us, I think, in the ongoing work that we have as a nation to reconceive that essential relationship between First Nations people and other people in this country. And really it lies at the heart of the goal I think we all share to realise productively a way of moving forward together, justly, equitably and honestly. And so I think I'll leave it there with uh, that suggestion uh, made about how we can rethink collections held in our great institutions and thank you for your time and interest. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation today. And we've had a couple of questions that have come through. I think we don't have a lot of time, um, but I will just ask uh, one question, uh, which uh, we might, uh, which is really about understanding um, the pivot that the National Museum made during this time. And um, Catherine Eyre is asking, do you think you will hold on to some of the pivots from the COVID era, era once things return to normal? And normal is in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fond of saying that I think uh, we're not talking about recovery here, it's about recreation. So I think what we've learned through the course of the past year will be taken into our work in the future because there is, there is no other course but for us to somehow incorporate and integrate those uh, learnings in our practice moving forward. And so I think that um, the, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a frankly an overused phrase, but the digital pivot, not just to the museum, but right across the board for all institutions is something that we're working now to integrate in our daily practice. And I don't think there'll be any returning to a pre-COVID age in our institutions. It's about taking forward what we've learned in productive ways for the future. Thank you. And actually, there is just one more, um, a couple of questions that I think we might need to deal with in, in another forum as well, because they are, I think, quite rich questions that we need to answer. But it's really about how museums can acknowledge the many items that have come into collections um, as often involuntarily and acknowledge the often, often unknown creators of objects and also uh, about understanding the shift to a new paradigm for coexisting ownership of museum collections. So I think there's some questions about collection ownership um, that um, uh, may, may take more than a few minutes to answer, but a, a couple of initial comments would be fantastic. I think for all of us, not just for museum collections, because indeed the great, um, the great uh, galleries, libraries, and indeed archives hold material culture collections that have come from source communities across this country and abroad. So there are implications for all of us that, that are responsible for part of the heritage of state of nation. But if I think about the compelling questions over the course of this century, I think the questions about restitution and repatriation of collections will be will feature strongly in all our work. But I also think that uh, as we work through those issues quite properly, we also will be emboldened to think differently about these collections that in truth we've always held in trust, but we've tended to understand as things uh, whose ownership was absolute in terms of the institution's capacity to work with those things. And I think the renegotiation of that, so we properly understand a shared sense of responsibility for these things between communities and our institutions will be the great work of this century for all of us. Thank you very much. At this point in time, um, I'd like to thank, um, ask everyone to virtually thank Dr. Matthew Trinker for his presentation today and for joining us at Information Online. We're about to take a short afternoon tea break and we'll be back at 2.45. You're most welcome to stay online for your afternoon yoga or if you still have time to visit the virtual exhibitions. So please take time for a stretch break or a visit to the um, exhibitor virtual booths and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.